Hey, Deserving Listeners, it's just me today. I thought I would answer some of your emails. This first email is from Anonymous Listener. They write, Is it true that couples counseling isn't advised in cases of abuse? I am not in an abusive relationship, but I often read in the Relationship Advice subreddit, and when someone writes about how they are being abused, someone who claims they are a couples counselor says that couples counseling isn't advised in cases of abuse because it tends to escalate the abuse that counselors are often manipulated by the abuser and end up taking the abuser's side. Is this true? A lot of people believe this person. It seems dangerous to spread this kind of information if it's not true. End of email. Yeah, well, you know, one, the internet is rife with misinformation, especially around uh, psychotherapy and psychology. But also in my field, there is a lot of misinformation. I would say that a majority of people in my field believe this to be true when it is not true. Certainly there are situations where couples counseling is not advised. You have a couple that comes in who, or you, someone calls you up and says they're looking for couples counseling and you ask a few questions, you find out there is domestic violence, intimate partner violence, high control, uh, coercion. And there are situations where it is not advised. It's, it's, um, I would find it hard to believe that in some situations it would be impossible to make couples therapy work. Now, the claim that it escalates the abuse is potentially true, right? You bring in the couple and the victim starts to voice their concern and then the perpetrator goes home and beats the victim because they spoke out in therapy. This rarely happens, by the way. It happens for sure, but it rarely happens. One, because if a perpetrator is willing to go to couples counseling, not all the time, but they're usually at the very least willing to try to tone it down. So because, you know, they don't have to go to couples counseling, right? There's plenty of people uh, who refuse to go. You know, uh, someone says, hey, let's go to couples counseling. And the partner is like, no, I'm not going to go. So the fact that they're just willing to come to an office and be potentially scrutinized by a therapist shows that there's some intention, maybe not a lot, but, you know, some at least minimal intention to try to make things a little better. They might not take responsibility for their behavior. They might still blame the victim, but you know, there's some intention there and they know they're being observed. Now Uh, there's a third party, a professional who presumably understands abuse and won't be pushed around. Right? So the abuser, the perpetrator, in my experience will tone it down, even if it's just temporary because they know that the victim has a voice. So, and often perpetrators actually want the relationship to be improved. They're using coercion and high control, usually because of attachment injury and terrifying notions of being alone, even though they can't consciously identify that. Certainly there are psychopathic, sadistic abusers who don't care, and those people are not necessarily... Um, well, I, I wouldn't even say that. The, the, the situation is that case by case basis, and it depends on the therapist. If you are not aware of domestic violence and you don't have training in that, and you might find yourself easily manipulated by an abuser, then yeah, you shouldn't be doing couples counseling with a uh, IPV in a partner violence couple. But for me, I in the beginning of my career treated perpetrators for you know, years and uh, in group format. These were the worst of the worst. These were people who were convicted of a crime of domestic violence and were mandated to uh, treatment programs, sometimes serving jail time. And these individuals were, uh, you know, particular. And there there was a, a way that they acted in the beginning of their awareness cycle or path. And I know how to deal with them. I'm not gonna say it's easy. I'm not gonna say that I don't have my countertransference, but uh, I'm not going to be pushed around. And uh, because I learned from the domestic violence specialists who definitely did not get pushed around by these people, (laughs) you know, I I watched them. They did not take any crap. I mean, if you're going to be a DV specialist, you got to be strong, right? And they were strong. And uh, this this woman, I forget her name. I wonder if she's still practicing. She was a lot older than me at the time, but she did not take any crap from these people. And I learned that. Now, I'm not like her because I'm not a DV 
a specialist, but uh, I've treated many, many uh, uh, perpetrators in couples therapy because what uh, there's a lot of pro now there are pros and cons. And that's always a thing. You know, whenever anyone says this is unethical or you can't do or the rules say you can't do this in therapy as a therapist, be very skeptical about that because there's almost nothing in our field that is cut and dry. A lot of it depends on your training, on the particular client, on whether or not you can make a justification for something. And when it comes to intimate partner violence and couples counseling, there are situations where you can make a case for it and it's all about pros and cons. So on the pro side, when you're treating uh, intimate partner violence with a couple, the couple is right there. Because you know I've treated perpetrators and victims individually in therapy for sure. And there's a barrier because we can't talk to the other person. You know, the abuser is telling me things and I just have to take the abuser's word for it, right? But if the victim were right there, I'd be able to go, is that true? And the victim could say, no, that's not true, actually. They're minimizing their abuse. So then I could confront the perpetrator more effectively if I knew from the victim exactly what was happening, right? Also, the victim benefits because if I'm just talking to the victim alone, you know, we can bolster their self-esteem, we can bolster their boundaries, we can bolster their right to feel safe, but they go home and the perpetrator is still perpetrating. Whereas if the victim tells me what's happening and I can go right to the perpetrator and go like, okay, what's going on there? How did you get to that point? I'm going to tell you that's not okay. You know, you can't intimidate people. You're injecting fear and terror into that person. It's not okay. It's okay to voice your concern. It's okay to talk about your feelings. It's not okay to intimidate other people. And I have a direct line, you know, within three seconds I can turn to the perpetrator within three seconds I can turn to the victim and we can bounce things off each other now the con to couples counseling is the victim might feel intimidated because the perpetrator is in the room and they might not feel safe enough to talk with me right that can be alleviated by meeting individually which I will do with intimate partner violence couples I will meet individually with perpetrator and victim periodically maybe even every other session you know I'll go couples then individual then couple and I spend a lot of time with the victim, helping them to feel entitled to feel safe. And that can take a long time. You know, some victims don't even feel entitled to feel safe. They just, well, this is my lot in life, or this is my job, or even, you know, what is safety? I've, I've never even been in a relationship that felt safe to me. And so, you know, there's a lot of victim work that needs to be done and can be accelerated by me having access, direct access, treatment access to the perpetrator. Now, can you also make a justification if a couple were to come to you that individual therapy was more um, you know quicker or f effective sure and uh, no one can argue with you you're just you're just making a case and you're recommending it to the couple and the couple can decide what they want to do with it so because um, the other thing is that because um, this whole ridiculous simplic you know s um, simplistic notion that couples counseling isn't um, justified because it might increase the abuse. Well, what, what, do you, what are they saying? Because if the victim goes into individual therapy, do you think the victim is, is not at risk of being abused? If the victim goes to individual therapy, the perpetrator knows what's happening, right? The perpetrator knows, oh, the victim is talking about me uh, in all likelihood. And the therapist is probably not happy with me. So do you think the perpetrator is just laying off the victim at that point no way you know the the perpetrator can absolutely abuse the victim so that they don't even go to therapy right so um it's not like it eliminates uh, this um possibility right the abuse the abuser is going to abuse and whether it's individual therapy or or couples therapy and again if i you say well they say well you should do individual therapy for both, right? For the perpetrator and, okay. But like I said earlier, what if the perpetrator is not acknowledging their abuse and the individual therapist, you know, because again, the other claim here that you say is that uh, abusers can um, manipulate the therapist. Do you think that individual therapists cannot be manipulated? Individual therapists, in my anecdotal experience, are much more prone to being manipulated by their clients than couples counselors. Why? Because you don't hear the other side when you're an individual therapist. I hear this all the time from people, both professionally and personally. They'll be like, you know, my therapist um, 
doesn't seem to really understand, you know, I vent all the time and my therapist becomes kind of convinced of my story. And I don't know if that's helpful to me. I kind of feel like I need to be pushed back on a little bit. Well, in couples and family therapy, and this is one of the glory, glorious aspects of being a marriage and family therapist is that you learn that people, when they tell you their account, they're distorted if they're in conflict with their family members. Now, how much are they distorted? I don't know, but um, you know, there's two sides to every story. Some of you might be able to relate to this where your partner went into therapy and they come out of therapy emboldened against you because the two of them just decided that the th- client's narrative was 100% accurate and you're the evil doer. You're the, you're the bad person and your partner had no culpability in the conflict, which of course is not usually the case. Whereas in couple and family therapy, you can't be that way because as soon as the person tells their narrative, the other person chimes in is like, no, that's not what happened. And let me tell you my side of the story. And it's really interesting uh, to experience that experience where people will be very convincing. You know, they'll telling, they're telling me their story and I'm just like, whoa, you know, that sounds, uh, and I'm building a picture in my mind of what happened. And then boom, the other person starts talking and I'm like, whoa, okay, this is adding a whole other spin to what happened. What really happened? I don't know. Is it somewhere in the middle? You know, and um, so the fact that manipulation of, of therapists happens, it, that's not um, exclusive to couples therapy. If anything, couples therapy, you're less likely to be manipulated. Having said that, um, can a, as I said earlier, an inexperienced couples therapist be manipulated by an abuser? Sure, you know, and like I said, so can an individual therapist, but but yeah, so in conclusion, and I, I rant about this to my trainees all the time, that you can go to a subreddit, you can talk to other therapists, you can even take an ethics class or an ethics training and get terrible information. The, the information that I operate from are the experts of the experts, people who write the books, people who train the, the, the professors, the lawyers who actually go to licensing board uh, hearings, who go to civil hearings, who go to criminal hearings. These people know, these are the, you know, the, the apex ethics experts. These people often have very different things to say things to teach me than the so-called ethics experts who are teaching the classes. You know, the vast majority of people who are teaching the classes, in my experience, anecdotally, are not actual experts. Now, might they know some things? Sure. But do they know everything? And I've seen, to be honest, extremely inexperienced clinicians being given the mantle of ethics professor because not a lot of people want to teach that class because it's not very exciting, right? Um, some people love it, but, uh, and I kind of like it, you know, I, I, especially when I was supervising people a lot more. Um, but uh, there's just so much misinformation. And I'm, gu- I'm guessing a lot of therapists out there listening right now uh, were under the impression that if there's abuse happening, couples therapy is not indicated. And, and I find that another aspect to this is just basically a paranoia about abuse. Like if you're, if you're experienced in, in treating abuse, um, you know, like the experiences I went through in my early career and have subsequently worked with a lot of abusers in individual marriage and family, in marriage and family therapy, then it doesn't, you don't really get so scared. Like you, you could find a situation where a month in, two months in, you're just like, yeah, I, I, I think that individual therapy might be better for this situation. You know, I think what a lot of clinicians, because of a lack of training or experience, they're just paranoid of working with abusers. And so they would rather just work with the victims. And so they, when, you know, people call in for therapy, they're just like, I, I'm scared. And so I will come up with a false ethical guideline and uh, operate from that. You know, it's, it's sort of like, a, actually, this is similar to the rejection of borderline people in therapy. There's a, there's a fear that therapists have because they're ill-trained and ill-supervised and have no mentors to help them. And uh, you, so you have, you have a scared uh, group of professionals. And then one person kind of raises their hand and they say, like, 
well, you know, therapy doesn't work with borderline, even though it's not true. It's like 100% not true. They'll be like, well, you know, borderlines can't be helped. Or they won't even identify it. Or they'll say borderlines will sue you or something. Or when it comes to abuse, it's just like, you know, couples therapy doesn't work for couples or something. And then everyone agrees with that because it gives them an excuse to have to deal with it. It gives them an out because they don't want to deal with it because they're afraid. And for me, when a couple, because the other thing is, is it's, it's hard to detect an abusive couple before you start treating them, before you start assessing, you know, the people that I've identified as perpetrators, they didn't call and say, um, I'm a perpetrator or my partner's a perpetrator. They call, I say, we have conflict. And then they're in my office. And over time, I'm like, oh, there's some, there's some coercion happening. There's some intimidation happening here. It's not usually like flat out violence. Cause like I said, those people aren't likely to come in if it was like full on massive high control. Those are more of the people I would see, you know, mandated by law. Um, but the, uh, the experiences that I have is that uh, I'm not afraid of it. You know, um, it has a lot of consequences and sometimes people get killed. Uh, I had a colleague where this happened, a perpetrator killed his wife while they were in therapy and his kid, by the way, I think it was actually a suicide as well. Anyway, um, and it happens, you know, there's risk, but it's, you know, that's a rare occurrence, rare enough anyway, that I, it doesn't really concern me. Uh, I mean, I, it's in the back of my mind. I'm like, well, do I need to account for that slight possibility about safety for the victim, that kind of thing. Um, now, having said all that, when I treat abusive people, abusive relationships, I spend a lot of time with the victim, you know, helping them again, as I said earlier, feel entitled, but also planning getting a DV advocate involved, uh, getting them connected with a, a shelter, telling them to call the police, telling the abuser that if this escalates, I'm instructing the two of you, particularly the victim, to call police. I might not use perpetrator victim language. I might just use like, I don't know, I might not label them at all. But sometimes I will. You know, If I have a good enough relationship with the perpetrator, I'll say you're abusive. What you're doing is abusive. And I get where it comes from. You come from an abusive family of origin, but uh, I'm, I'm labeling this on purpose because I need you to understand like what you're doing is is terrifying the, your partner. It's unfair what you're doing. It's okay, again, to voice your feelings. It's not okay to create an environment where they have to walk on eggshells around you. That's not okay. Actually, before I go on to another email, I, I, I wanna say this, because I was actually kind of ranting with my students the other day about this, that. I understand, you know, if you're a clinician, how disheartening this is because it's like, well, what are the rules? You know, what are, what's tell me what to do? I, I'm a I'm a green therapist and I, I don't have experience and I, I don't have a mentor to guide me through. I just need to know what the rules are, you know, because it will feel better. And I was like this too in the beginning of my career. I was because I had this impression that there were certain rules, but then as time went on, I was like. You know, I remember I, I always tell this story in ethics class when I was 26 years old. The professor said, "If you, there are situations where you can be sued if you, uh, what was the situation? I think it was like a teenager using cocaine every day and tells you about it in individual therapy. And um, if you don't tell the parents that the kid, you know, you don't have a relationship with the parents. It, but if, if you don't tell the parents and the kid overdoses on cocaine, even though the kid is above 13 in Washington State, they have confidentiality. If you don't break that confidentiality as a you know safety measure to the parents and the kid dies, the parents could sue you successfully for not telling them. If you tell the parents, the kid could sue you successfully for breaking confidentiality. And I remember saying, well, that's a problem. If, if a system doesn't have clear guidelines, you know, imagine driving on the road and it's just like, well, a, a red light means stop and go. <laughs> I mean, that's essentially what this is, right? Um, and it was very upsetting. But years later, uh, a much more what I would consider to be, um, you know, apex expert told me, a lawyer, that it's not what you do, it's how you do it. So, if you just take an action on your own and a bad consequence happens, then you're much more likely to be successfully sued or sanctioned because you didn't utilize proper procedure. Proper procedure is consultation, thought, 
documentation, ex, you know, maybe a little exploration. Like you talk with the teenager about, hey, I think I should tell your parents about your drug. And then you, you document all that effort that you put. You know, if you don't tell the parents, you have to uh, um, account for the for the danger that the kid is putting themselves through by doing a lot t- to try to convince them to stop using or to tell their parents or to go to a treatment program. And if you can, so in with that body of evidence, if the kid did die, that you did a lot and it's all documented and you consulted with outside people and you talked, should I break confidentiality and talk to the parents? And you talked it over and ultimately based on a number of factors, you decided not to break confidentiality and tell the parents you because of the following reasons. You thought that the kid was going to bust out of therapy if you broke confidentiality and you thought if I need to have you know this person have a tether to someone who they're talking to. Um, there was some movement towards sobriety. They did, you know, the child did admit that they had a problem and we were heading in that direction. We did talk about the dangers of overdose and these kinds of things. And they understood that and they were trying to, you know, minimize those dangers. If the child dies and the parents sue you, you can encounter with this body of evidence. And that's ethical. It's not what you do. It's the process and the documentation of that process that can be demonstrated when there's an inquiry. So if you are treating a couple with who, who are experiencing intimate partner violence and you have no documentation of consultation or thought or pros and cons or um, efforts to try to help the victim feel heard, efforts to try to make sure that you're not siding with the perpetrator, If there's no documentation and something bad happens, um, then you could be successfully implicated as, you know, um, negligent or unethical. Whereas if you do that and you document all your decision making process, your consultation, the efforts you put into helping the victim feel safe, you know, if you do all that and something bad happens and somewhat there's an inquiry, they're like, well, you know, so it's not what you do. Sometimes it is what you do. But often it isn't. Often it's if there's a dilemma, like, do I do this or do that? If you show your work and it's um, the standard of care in terms of what work you need to do to make that decision, then you're probably okay. And that's what lawyers will tell me. You know, it's not it's not what you do. And that is um, scary to novice therapists because they're just like, wait, so everything I could be sued for a lot of things and also either direction I go, there's a lot of whys in the road where I can be sued successfully either direction. <laughs> That's scary, right? Uh, and, uh, but, but the pro to that ambiguity and uncertainty is case by case basis. That imagine if we just had this blanket rule that you cannot treat couples when there's a, an abuser in that couple. Well, it would really limit our options to apply what we believe to be the best treatment plan to a particular case. And and it would be completely arbitrarily applied because uh, research shows that you can treat couples with intimate partner violence. Um, yeah, so this is a kind of a huge pet peeve of mine. Uh, and there are even um, experts in our field, you know, in, in couples therapy who will say that they never treat people when there's intimate partner violence. And I find it to just be kind of strange. It's like, um, because there, there are different degrees of intimate partner violence, right? You know, we all have it in our head about like what a severe domestic violence relationship look, looks like, but there are people lower on the spectrum who have mild or moderate amounts of control and intimidation who, probably wouldn't be seen as a domestic violence couple because you know there's no hitting involved for example but there are people who are basically on the spectrum of domestic violence and so where's the line you know there's a lot of people in that category by the way <laughs> so um i don't know it's it, it it's um it's a misunderstanding that i think one and it's not just that one, right? There's so many other misunderstandings of ethics that I, I talk about sometimes in our field. And it's just really um, humiliating and embarrassing to be a part of a field 
that doesn't even understand itself. Because if you polled therapists, most of them, I'm guessing, would say would agree with this with this rigid misunderstanding of ethics regarding intimate partner violence and couples therapy. And that's embarrassing that I, I'm a part of a field that doesn't even understand what, what we're doing. <laughs> There's so many examples of that, particularly as I get older and, and start just hearing from, you know, emails, people email in and, and hearing about other professors saying things, um, or maybe I'm just getting intolerant of it. You know, like there's this one thing that I, this pet peeve of mine that I would hear from students of mine that other professors would tell them about like therapy techniques. Um, there's this extremely simplistic, um, t um, a course material thing that's taught to students that has to do with like how you're supposed to be as a therapist. For example, they'll say never cross your arms as a therapist because that shows that you're closed off to your client. And um, I, I this notion might on paper seem wise, but it, it doesn't make any sense. This notion that you cannot be open emotionally to someone if you're crossing your arms. Now, I don't think I've ever crossed my arms as a therapist while I was, you know, working as a therapist because it, it would just be kind of a weird body position to be in. But in class, I will demonstrate how I can absolutely convey empathy and openness while crossing my arms. Or my, And they also say don't cross your legs, which even sounds stupider, right? It's like if you want to cross, your, what, you know. So there's these notions of like, you have to sit a certain way as a therapist. And if you don't sit, if you sit the other way, you're being a bad therapist is essentially the message. And these are ridiculous, simplistic notions. And I have to disabuse my trainees of these notions. And they, they learned those notions in other classes in my program <laughs> where other professors are telling them this stuff. I don't know how prevalent it is today, but... You know, it, it's it, it's a really it's like an it's like ninth graders trying to teach other people how to be a therapist. Like, don't cross your arms. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, human communication and a connection is way beyond what you're doing with your arms. <laughs> now, should you be aware of your body? Yes. Should you be aware of your body language? Absolutely. That's a big part of it. But these sort of blanket rules. Um. There's all sorts of things like that, like how you're supposed to show uh, empathy, how you're supposed to reflect emotions. There's certain phrases you're supposed to use. You're supposed to, you know, take what they say and and just repeat it. But, you know, there's certain techniques. And again, they're guidelines and they're, they're good ideas to sort of start with in terms of like, here's something to think about. But in terms of like, here's what you're supposed to do and here's what you're not supposed to do is um, ridiculous. <laughs> You know, it's like uh, when people say, like, on a, don't cry on a first date. And I'm like, well, what if both people want to cry? <laughs> Plus, what's wrong with crying? You know, it's, it's fine. Crying tears are fine. What if you're sad? <laughs> you know? What if you're happy and you cry? At a, you know, these, these notions of, like, you know, never talk about your ex on the first date. Sure, you know, if someone, if you don't know, and you don't know if, if it's safe to talk about your ex or it's safe to cry, then maybe it's better to take the safer road on the first date until you get to know someone. But there's there's nothing inherently successful or, you know, enhanced success enhancing about not talking about your ex and not crying on the first date. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of cases where people cry and talk about their ex on the first date and they fall in love and they're fine. Even if it was a little awkward, it also could enhance a first date, right? Some people are looking for that. In fact, I've told people that. I've said, if someone goes on a first date with you and they cry and talk about their ex, that shows maturity. That shows difference. Not always, depending on how they talk about it. But to me, I would say that shows, especially if it's a dude, right? If a dude cries on the first date, like snatch that guy up for a second date because that shows that shows masculinity, that shows courage, that shows emotional awareness. And what's the alternative, right? I only want to date people who never cry and aren't vulnerable and don't talk about authentic, real things and fake their way through the first five dates. Like, okay, if, you know, if, if that's what you're into. But the point is, it's like, why are there these rules that we put on things that don't make any sense? Well, we're trying to make order out of chaos. You know, being a therapist is just like one of the most chaotic 
you know, I, I've been in this profession for 25 years. I still don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm exaggerating. I, I feel pretty confident. But, but uh, I don't have a grasp on being a therapist, that's for sure. I, you know, it's not like I go through my sessions with my clients feeling 100% sure of what's happening all the time, you know. And it's not like uh, when I look back on a session, I don't see like, huh, I wonder if I shouldn't have done that or I wonder if I should have gone down that road. It's such a chaotic thing. You know, there's so many options. There's billions upon billions of options that can occur in one session. And you as a therapist have to choose one option, even if it is quote unquote, just listening, you know, that's, and there's different kinds of listening. It's, you know, what, what exactly do you emphasize as you listen? How do you listen? And so it's a chaotic thing, endeavor. And so we're trying to make order out of chaos. And so we make rules and it makes us feel better, but it's simplistic. All right, we're back from the break. This next email is from a patron from Europe. She says, uh, that's how she refers to herself, patron from Europe. She says, I'm histrionic. Why does attention from a man in another relationship matter to me that much? I really wish there was more information on histrionic personality disorder. It seems like you are the only person on the internet who explained the nature of it. Simply listening to you talking about histrionic made me feel better. I feel like I'm wasting my youth and my life focusing on things that matter only to my ego, my looks, my persona, whether people find me beautiful and hot. I simply lure all these men, and as soon as I receive their adoration, I sabotage any form of emotional closeness. Then I'm left with never-ending emptiness and regret. And the funniest part is I'm a virgin. It extremely contradicts my persona, and people find it hard to believe. Recently, I had my first kiss with a man who was cheating on his long-term partner. It's hard for me to admit that the fact he told me he's taken made me probably want him more. I seduced him just by looking at him across the restaurant, and later that night, things escalated quickly. I obviously knew he didn't really know me. He's much older and basically was treating me like a doll. But his desperation that night, all the things he was telling me, were just like a histrionic dream. I've never been... I've never seen a man that desperate for me. He even took me to his hotel room and made me promise him that we'd meet the next day. We didn't meet the next day because he realized that he had to detach for the reasons uh, of infidelity and had to figure out how to get back, how to get rid of my lipstick stains all over his white shirt. He went back to his country and I didn't care truly, but with time I started to romanticize the whole thing and miss him. But that's not the end. After that memorable night, his best friend messaged me and confessed his love at first sight as well. And I have been chatting with him just to uh, feed my narcissistic supply. My therapist says I have traits of both histrionic and narcissistic. The situation is one big mess. I don't know how to forget or and how to stop chatting and manipulating that other guy just for that shallow short-term satisfaction. I can't even count how many men tried to pursue me within the last month, but I don't care about them. I know, I know I have other traits other than my hot body. I know that I'm a good person. My friends truly like me. I have many talents I should focus on, but I simply can't. I feel so lost. I only want to feel the love I felt that night with that married man. And even if he cared for my looks only, he still cared and made me feel in the center of his attention, like the only girl that mattered. My dad throughout my whole life didn't give me as much attention as that man did. End of email. Yeah. Well, first off, patron from Europe, you're extremely self-aware and you're in therapy with a therapist that seems to get it. So you're, you're doing really good. And these, you know, this disorder, as you know, from my deep dive, it's schema based, based, you know, and, and, internalization interject base meaning that it takes a lot of corrective experiences to correct for and you you know you really kind of hit it um on the head the nail on the head with the last sentence my dad throughout my whole life didn't get didn't give me as much attention as that man did meaning that i think what you're meaning is that that man in one night gave me more attention than my than my dad gave me my entire life and that's the that's the experience of the histrionic person. And, and, and you also, you know, mentioned narcissistic supply, histrionic and narcissistic and borderline are very similar. And, um, it wouldn't be uncommon for people with histrionic to 
also be conceptualized as being narcissistic. You know, they're, they're, you could say that they're just shades of a different thing. But the um, experience typically to the child is lack of attention. And you learn as a child to cope with that by amping up your attention seeking signals because uh, you're not, so it's not only attention that you're not getting as a child, you're not also not getting attunement, you're not getting love, you're not getting security. And so you, uh, for various reasons, maybe because this is, your parents responded this way, maybe your dad, that if you came across as extremely alluring, you know, you know as a two-year-old, it, would, it wouldn't be sexual necessarily. It can be sometimes, but it, it, it usually isn't. It's more like being a cute little girl and that you find gets a little bit more attunement from dad. But again, it's not enough. And so you just start orienting yourself. It's sort of like if your town has no water and you learn over time that when it starts to rain, there's this one, you know, bucket that fills up with water. And, and if you get there first, then you get a little bit of water and you can survive that day. Well, if your survival depends on that water, then you are hypervigilant about all sorts of things about that. You, you start to notice when clouds start to form. You start to kind of feel this different barometer thing in the air. You start to, um, you know, you just become extremely attuned. And you might even just live right next to that bucket. You might just sleep and exist just right next to that bucket. Well, that's what it's like to be histrionic is that um, because you're deprived, you orient your life, com you know, 99% of your life is oriented around that resource of attention and attunement. And if you are given attention and attunement because of a particular behavior by being, um, you know, I, again, seductive is a funny word to apply to a five-year-old, but, um, you know, soliciting, maybe that's a good word. It's just like, dad, look at me. Hey, I'm funny. And, you know, um, displays of, of, um, displays of attention seeking behavior, I guess, you know, displays of like, look at me and displays of you better look at me or, you know, I know how to get you to look at me. You know, those kinds of things get rewarded. Then as an adult, you retain. So, so take that guy who is sleeping next to the bucket, take him out of that community and put him in a community where there's ready tap water that's clean and safe all the time. Well, he, to the day he dies, unless he recovers from his traumas, he will probably sleep next to the, next to the sink, right? Because he only feels safe next to running water, right? He, he can't just sleep in the bedroom because his neurons are, are oriented towards you know, that resource. And that's the same with histrionic. It's the same with a, a lot of the personality disorders, but with histrionic, it's, you know, your entire personality is oriented around attention, maybe from men, because maybe there's a thing with your dad and uh, for good reasons. But the problem is, is that um, you, it eclipses all of your other needs, you know, to use the analogy of the water, you're sleeping next to the sink, but you, you never um, go outside. And so you are neglecting all your other needs. You know, you might not even have relationships with other people because you're just so obsessed with making sure that you are near the water. Well, when you're obsessed with getting attention and um, intense attention, not just attention, but like intense and one way to get it if um, you, you know, can is to get sexual attention, right? To get that sort of new relationship energy attention. And interesting that it was an older person as well, which is common to histrionic people sometimes. Um, so uh, it eclipses all of your other needs, right? Your needs for closeness, your needs for self love, your needs for a relationship, you know, maybe even sexual needs, that kind of thing. And so uh, you're describing it very well and you're very aware of it. And, um, you know, you're not really a asking any questions, right? You didn't really. Oh, um, why does attention from a man in another relationship matter to me that much? Okay, well, I think I answered. And I feel, I feel like you, you know that, you know, from the way you're writing. Um, so the, you're in therapy, that's good. And the corrective experience is attention. 
the corrective experience is attention from a parental figure like a therapist that it you know uh, tells you that you don't have to be hyper vigilant to get attention you will just get it naturally best case scenario as we're being raised by our caregivers we learn that we get attention most of the time just by being us because our parents love us we don't have to um, solicit the attention um, sometimes we do like hey I'm I'm running watch me you know maybe a little bit and it's quickly given when we need it right so we don't have to sleep next to the water fountain we we can you know we can venture away and the, the water will still be there we we can not pay attention to getting attention and we will get attention so in therapy if your therapist gives you sufficient attention a, a therapeutic attention not sexual attention which actually can be a problem sometimes people like you patron from europe can can uh, uh, prom, um, cause you know uh, or elicit or trigger erotic countertransference in a therapist that they have to deal with now good therapists know how to deal with that right but anyway so with enough corrective experience of attention that you don't have to work for that you just get for just being you the more you don't have to be hyper vigilant to get attention the more you just learn that attention will just happen naturally and i i don't have to i don't have to constantly seek this like addictive high of someone being like in love with me you know because that's the other thing about this that i would focus on which is that when we are two we don't want our parents to just kind of know us we want our parents to completely know us we want our parents there all the time and they usually are you know when we're 12 to 14 months in best case scenario you know your parents are there a lot and you're or at least your set of caregivers maybe there's a babysitter or nanny involved or something but you have this constant um unconditional supply of of narcissism you know children are narcissistic it's all about them and that's okay right and so um so what the thing that you're looking for is a version of that and the, the way to get it perhaps given your situation the fastest way to get it is to find someone to, to fall deeply in lust with you or deeply in love with you you know you were saying that he treated you like a doll and you know there was some issue that he was working out some commensurate issue in his life that he needed that you know and was apparently self-destructing um, and so you could draw the analogy that in that moment he was treating you, you know, if you just get rid of the sexual component of it, but you retain the physical sensual, you know, cause parents are physically sensual with children, not sexual. Right. But there's a lot of cuddling and holding and breastfeeding and, and sleeping together. You know, there's a lot of skin on skin contact with parents and children optimally. And on a, uh, an approximation of that as an adult is a intense in love infatuation experience right and so the fastest way to get uh, to emulate what you're seeking for as a corrective experience is is often through these obsessive desperate older men <laughs> you know and and it, it fulfills your need for a second, which is good. You know, it's a little bit of, of corrective experience. The problem is, is that it locks in this type of relationship as your only way of getting that kind of need met. Now, you might be asking, how can I possibly engineer that with my therapist? Because we can't cuddle, you know, they, they don't, they're not going to fall in love with me. They're not going to, they're not going to call me in the middle of the night because they're obsessed with me. That's what I'm looking for. Yes, but it's the slow road, right? You, you just got to keep at it and really absorb it. It takes a long time to rid yourself or to heal from and recover from the traumas that generate histrionic. It takes a lot of time. And so uh, as you're in therapy, in, you know, do your best to internalize the attention that you're getting. It's not histrionic, narcissistic attention, but it's still attention. And, but it's safe and it's steady and it's consistent 
and it's and it's unconditional, right? You know, your therapist is unconditionally taking. Yeah, I guess you have to pay them, but you're aside from that, you know, they're paying attention to you and they're into it. You know, their soul, heart, mind, body, and soul are paying attention to you, and um, and it's much more sustainable this kind of attention. Now, if you can engineer that, it sounds like you have friends, right? You 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 have you say my friends truly like me. Same. Try to. Because what histrionic people will do sometimes is the kind of attention you were getting from the fella at the restaurant, it, it, it's, it registers more than when you're getting attention from your friends. It's like it doesn't register. And so part of it is making sure that you register it. Sometimes you can consciously make sure that your soul and your psyche really registers the attention as unconditional and um, satisfying and satiating, if that makes any sense. All right, this next email is from anonymous listener. They say, is there anything you can do to help yourself with avoidant personality disorder? After listening to your podcast, I'm 99% certain that I have avoidant personality disorder and it's been a struggle since I was a child. I've been to multiple therapists and nothing has helped because I've been misunderstood and misdiagnosed with social phobia. It seems like none of my none of the therapists I've gone to even know that avoidant personality disorder exists since it's not that talked about and under researched. So since most therapists can't help, what can you do as self help? End of email. Yeah, well the first thing I'll say is that um, as another embarrassment about my field is that it's I would say on average most therapists do not understand most of the personality disorders, even though they're clearly discussed in the DSM, which every therapist should understand forward and backwards. I blame this on training programs. I blame it on our culture, you know, as, as an industry, there's a, there's even a movement away from personality disorders, which I find to be just like, what? Like if you have another system for describing personality, fine, but there are people who don't even think about personality. They're just like, it's, they, they consider it to be, pseudoscience and it's like no <laughs> it's a model that is extremely helpful and seems to be quite accurate to, to people's lives um so there's that and i'm you know so i'm not surprised that you've gone to multiple therapists and it seemed like they might not have even known avoidant personality disorder exists the other thing you're saying is that you've been misdiagnosed with social phobia social phobia is a pretty good approximation. You know, if if a therapist thought you had social phobia and they're like, wow, this person has severe social phobia, that is not an, that could be a helpful conceptualization and drive proper treatment of avoidant personality disorder. So just because they were saying you have social phobia doesn't mean that, that they weren't in the right ballpark. So there's that. Um, and I, you know, I discussed that all in the deep dive, the potential differences between social phobia. And mainly, if I remember right, the avoidant personality disorder has to do with deep schemas. It's not just like, because uh, the general delineating uh, line between social phobia and avoidant is people who have social phobia usually know that there's something unreasonable about their reactivity, whereas avoidant personality disorder people are completely convinced that their reactivity is 100% rational, which of course is the hallmark of a personality disorder. Anyway, so um, so anonymous listener, you're aware of it, which is great. You've been to therapy, which is great. And you're saying, um, I give up. Well, I wouldn't give up. You know, I, this could be, I don't know, a part of your avoidance to avoid therapy that you're just like, I give up, you know, it's, it would be, it's, it's very common for people with avoidant personality disorder to avoid therapy because it's scary. You know, it's a social endeavor to be in therapy. And so you might just be looking for an excuse to give in to your distortion. So I would continue to seek a therapist. The other thing I would do is I would just call 10 therapists and say, do you know about avoidant personality disorder? How would you treat it? And, you know, I would hope that at least one of them would have a good response. So you know, that's another thing that, that I might do. But you ask, you know, what you can, what can you do with self-help? Well, similar to histrionic, whenever it comes to personality disorders, we're, we're looking at corrective experiences and awareness. So one is awareness, which is the notions and the distortions that pop into your head. You have to be able to, you have to push back on them. You know, notions that you're defective and ridiculous and everyone knows it is 
actually ridiculous. <laughs> the fact that you think everyone thinks you're ridiculous is ridiculous. No one cares. Or if they do, who cares what their opinion is about you? It doesn't threaten you, actually. It feels threatening because that it was threatening when you were a child, but it's not threatening anymore. You, you know, you're a, a competent, you know, normally defective human. <laughs> you know, we all have defectiveness and people see them sometimes. Who cares? You know, it, it's just, but that's hard to convince oneself, but you have to push back. So that's part of the awareness. And the other part is corrective experiences, which heal the generating... Um, factors that lead to us having to push back in the first place, which involves people treating us, someone, cl people close to us, i.e. a therapist and others, that we are not defective, that we are good, that we're competent, that we're okay as we are. We don't have to trick people into liking us. We don't have to hide our um, deficiencies. It's okay. We're okay as we are. And that can only be really internalized through a relationship that really demonstrates that. So that's the self-help awareness, pushing back and corrective experiences. All right. This next email is from listener, Sean. He writes, why do people feel they can psychologically evaluate and diagnose others based on general psychological information online? Do you feel the general psychological advice given in social media does more good or harm? Many people try to diagnose and assess others remotely as well as themselves without professional consultation. End of email. Yeah, I mean, I kind of was talking about this earlier. I mean, even among clinicians, I'll hear, I'll hear clinicians saying ridiculous things online sometimes. And, you know, maybe they think I'm ridiculous. I'm guessing many do. But, and I guess that's the opinion-based nature of our field, I guess. But, yeah, um, I guess I'm used to it. Uh, since the internet started in the 90s, bad information around psychology, because I've been a therapist since the mid 90s and and have, you know, basically the, the internet and misinformation around psychology, I've known, you know, been dealing with it for 30 years. So it doesn't, it doesn't really affect me. Um, and that's part of the reason why I decided to make a podcast myself. It wasn't the main reason, but it was one of the reasons, which is that, Look, if you as a therapist or a professional are seeing misinformation online and you're not doing anything about it, then you're part of the problem. Now, not everyone can, you know, create a YouTube channel or a podcast, but it's as an industry, if we're not doing something to counteract the misinformation online, then as an industry, we're part of the problem. We can't just say, "Well, I don't want to do it" or "I don't I don't understand how to use the internet." You know, like participate, get on, you know, at the very least you can comment right on Reddit or YouTube. You can just be like, actually, D D D, you know, you know, there's a way to do it. That doesn't annoy people. But that was part of the reason why I started the podcast is because I wanted to spread scientific based evidence based information. I also wanted to counteract uh, the evidence based movement, which privileges cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a fine form of therapy that I use all the time, but it's not the only evidence-based therapy. And so there's just all these misunderstandings that I felt the lay public would benefit from me as a professional talking about, and also other therapists would benefit from me talking about. Am I the only voice on the internet? No, especially today in 2021, there's plenty of others contributing, which is great. In the beginning, there were not. When I started this podcast, so let me just, <laughs> I talked about this before, but and as time goes on, this fact is more and more absurd to me. When I started this podcast in 2008, there were three other psychology podcasts in the world. Now, maybe there were some in other languages that I couldn't, you know, decipher, but there's a chance that there weren't. I mean, because, you know, psychology is a pretty big focus in the Western world, English speaking world, and podcasts in 2008 were pr primarily you know, dominated by English speaking podcasts. So in terms of, um, at the very least, I'll tell you that in the English speaking word, the world, there were only three other psychology podcasts and only one of them still exists, which is, um, Dr. Dave's podcast shrink. The shrink is in, I think it's called. Um, I've listened, I've been listening to it since I think Oh five when he started or something, but I was the fourth <laughs> psychology podcast today. There's got to be a million, I don't know, tens of thousands of psychology podcasts, you know, maybe not like straight up psychology, but like 
you know, psychology, there's a lot of psychology adjacent, you know, like there's psychology of film podcasts and psychology of sports podcasts, you know, so there's all these ancillary psycho psychology podcasts as well. And when I started, I was just like, um, no one's, none of us are talking. None of us as therapists or very few of us are actually speaking up and saying, actually, let me tell you, you know, and w the kind of old school value that I th is changing ever so slowly is that psychology is, a, is something that happens in the ivory tower. It's that something that happens in academia. I mean, how many researchers in psychology do you know are on YouTube? They should be on YouTube. <laughs> like, and the, the thing that um, I find uh, frustrating is that 99.9% .9 of researchers and, and psychotherapists in academia are oriented towards peer reviewed journals, which are great, right? You know, research journals are, are great. You know, they, uh, so much good has happened in, in all of our fields, astronomy, medicine, and beyond, engineering, physics, chemistry, uh, through the system of peer reviewed journals, right? Because you, uh, pub, you, know, you, you work on a lot, a big study, it's peer reviewed, you know, these studies get published and they get de debated, you know, it's a whole academic system that has its pros and its cons, but it has a lot of pros. I mean, we can attribute a lot of our scientific advances to that peer reviewed journal system. So I don't want to throw that out. It's, it has its function and, and probably always will. But part of the original purpose of publishing in a peer reviewed journal was to get the information out there was to inform not just other scientists, but the world on science and research findings, things that will benefit people. You know, someone does a research study on um, something about one's diet. And when they're doing that research, I'll tell you, they hope the public will read those things. The public does not read peer reviewed journals. <laughs> they don't, they just don't. Um, you know, a few people do, but you know, many clinicians don't even read peer reviewed journals in my experience. So, so if we're going to, so if as scientists and clinicians, we want to get information out there, we have to orient a portion of our efforts towards the media that humans actually use, not peer reviewed journals all the time. Again, let's do that. Let's continue. But if we're trying to communicate with the public, if you truly want to help people, which a lot of scientists do, you know, they, they want to provide a finding, you know, like in psychology, it's like we found that mindfulness helps, da, da, da. Okay, peer reviewed journal, do a study that that's important, you know, to demonstrate the science and to figure all that out, contribute to the body of science. But then you, you got to communicate to the public. And if you go through a journalist, a lot of times the journalists have no idea how to write about this stuff and they misinform the public. You know, they'll exaggerate the title. This is why there's all these ridiculous um, articles written on like Psychology Today and stuff. And when you actually look at the research, you're just like, you're exaggerating that finding <laughs> because journalists don't know what they're talking about because they're not clinicians. They're not scientists. And to be a scientific, a science journalist requires you to have a pretty high science literacy and skepticism and uh, critical thinking. Whereas, you know, and most journalists don't have that um, so, anecdotally. So you, uh, at least some of us in our industry have to be, you know, uh, creators of our own content where we control the content, where we control the headlines, we control what's being told to the public. Because if we have that ability, if we have that journalistic content creating ability, which, you know, it's a skill, it's not something you're just born with, then it's, it gives us the greatest chance as an industry to inform the public and benefit the public. We're trying, I, there are so many people that I work with who are doing fantastic research and work. And I'll talk with them and they'll, you know, they'll be telling me about this and that. And I'll just be like, oh my God, like you are doing amazing work. And I'll say, how are you sharing this with the public? And, and they'll be like, huh? Or they'll say, oh, you know, I do CEUs. I do continuing education, uh, you know, education classes. And I'll be like, well, how many people come? And they were like, oh, you know, I, I got like eight people to come last time. I'm like eight people and other clinicians, right? It's like, what you're doing needs to be told to everyone. 
not only other clinicians, but and not only clinicians in our in, in our you know profession and marriage and family therapy, but you got to change, you got to share it with everyone, and it has to be told to the public. And this is an important thing that a lot of people have mis misunder have a misunderstanding of, and and you know uh, sometimes I would inspire a colleague to to do that, but often they they would um, turtle themselves because of the fear of being online or unfamiliarity with social media or, or something. And, and again, if, if that's someone that's fine, but if, if as an industry, if we don't put more of an effort, we get what we get, which is a society that has no idea what they're talking about. And they're all, and they're in, they're educating themselves. It's the blind leading the blind online when it comes to psychology. And we see the result of that. And if we do nothing as an industry, we're part of the problem. And that, so that's you know why I again one of the ten reasons why I started the podcast in the first place. All right, the sixth email is from listener Russ. He writes in and says, "How do you get so much done? How do you accomplish so much? You have a YouTube channel, a practice. I'm assuming you have a life and other stuff. Do you have any tips or a podcast talking about how you get so much done?" End of email. Yeah. So this is one of the things that. I have talked about over the years because people have asked me this question even off of the podcast, you know, in my regular, in your real life life. Um, it was particularly prominent in the past. Like when I was getting my doctorate, I, in the early, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago, I was, um, I got my doctorate like midway through my career. I operated as a master's level professor and therapist and podcaster for a long time. Then I got my doctorate. Anyway, I got my doctorate and was actually going really fast through the program. Like I was, I was taking, you know, more classes than was recommended. So, I, you know, I was really overloading myself with that. And and getting a doctorate is, you know, in psychology is extremely time consuming, as I'm sure y'all know. Uh, and a doctorate in psychology to become a psychologist, there are multiple internships you have a dissertation you know it's not just classes it's all this other stuff and it was very time consuming at the same time i was a full-time professor at antioch at the same time i was doing a podcast at the same time i was in a band that and we were playing regularly and i and i was the the main leader of the band i wrote all the music and you know did all the all the bookings and all the organization and i also had a practice um, you know, it's a part-time practice, but you know, a fair amount of clients, maybe, I don't know, 10 clients a week or something. And I also had a supervision practice, you know, where I was super supervising post-grad people, you know, maybe five to 10 people. And I had a life, you know, you know, I, I socialized a lot actually back then, you know, it was a pre-pandemic when I was younger and had a lot of younger friends and, um, yeah. So how do you do all those things? Well, you know, I have a whole deep dive on time management. You can listen to that. And I, I detail a lot of it there, but I'll just, you know, say that I have a, tr I, I physically have a lot of energy. I used to, I'm getting older now, I'm 50. And so I find myself actually not getting as much done these days because I feel like my, you know, back before when I had tons of energy, I, people would say like, you seem to be constantly like doing something. <laughs> I wasn't like frantic. I wasn't, you know, like hyperactive, but I didn't do a lot of like just chilling, you know, vegging. I didn't, I didn't do a lot of veg time. And um, the older I get, the more veg time I need where I'm just sort of, you know, my, my version of veg is to browse YouTube. I just sit there and YouTube just knows what I want to watch. And so, you know, I'll watch like a video on chemistry or a video on fixing an acoustic guitar or something. And I'll just sit there and, and watch it. And that's my, and I'll do that for a couple hours a day, maybe more. And, um, I didn't used to do that. So, uh, I, I think a part of it is just my disposition. Um, in our field, we'll, we'll call it hypomania, not like in the bipolar sense, but in the general psychological sense of just like a lot of energy. And um, so I think that gives me an advantage in terms of getting a lot of things done. The other thing is, is I, you know, now I kind of do, I guess, with YouTube, but throughout my life, I didn't watch much TV at all. You know, there, 
there are certain people and you know some people will say well i don't watch a lot of tv but if you actually took if you actually kept track of how many hours of tv or netflix or that kind of stuff you watch you know it can actually add up to quite a bit and so you know movies this kind of thing and i watched movies i i loved movies i i would go to the theater uh pre-pandemic like two or three times a week i just love going to the theater i just love it sometimes i think it's just the popcorn but but i don't know i love film and i i love being in that dark room and enjoying a movie with other people and anyway so uh, i would go to movies but i didn't watch a lot of tv and um that obviously gives me potentially like four hours a day to do stuff with. The other thing, the other tip I'll say is that I'm extremely obsessed with time management, meaning that I push back on anything that feels like a waste of time. Like at my university, uh, back when I was full time, there would be these, there'd be so many of these little tasks, like little meetings that you had to attend. And I was hyper vigilant about my time where I, you know, I would go to a meeting and I'd be like, this is a waste of time there. I'm, I'm not getting anything done. No one needs me to be here. I could have been doing something that mattered in this moment. I could have been correcting papers. I could have been working on my music. I could have been working on my podcast and I would notice that and it would really rub me wrong. And I feel like most people don't think this way. I think this is a slight narcissistic trait that I have. And I've seen other narcissistic people have this uh, behavior as well. They get very impatient, um, as I do, in situations that seem like a waste of their time. You know, because narcissistic people tend to value their time a lot because they think they matter more than other people. And so, uh, so I would I really focus on that. And so what that did is I I, I was pretty much in a you know hour by hour basis evaluating: is this worth my time? Is this what I want to be doing? And and match that up with assertiveness around my time where I'd be like, nope, not going to do that. Or sometimes in the middle of a meeting, I just be like, oh, I, I, you know, I just make an excuse and I would just bounce because I'm like, this is worthless. I'm out where I found that 99, I don't know, 98 percent of people would never do that. They would never even question because their boss told them that they had to go to this meeting. So they just went. And I'm always like you know, your boss is just another human being. There's nothing inherently wise about that person, about your time. You know, you have to uh, evaluate for yourself whether or not this is, because the other thing is it was, you, it was almost always a waste of the university's time as well, because the university has to pay for me to be in that meeting and I don't come cheap, right? And so I w was doing a favor to the university by spending my time doing other things that were more useful to the university, you know, and, and I would make that determination. And a lot of administrators did not understand how to evaluate that because of the useless amount of meetings that I was attending, <laughs> especially when I was program director, when I was chair of the program, there are so many tasks that you have to do as a program director. And I, and, and I had even more meetings as pro program director, right? Um, and sometimes the uselessness of the meeting had to do with poor leadership. It's often usually what it was and poor time management and da, da, da. They didn't have an agenda. I mean, I would literally sit down in a meeting with like the, the top uh, program directors at, at my university. So, the, you know, these are the, the bosses. All the bosses are sitting in a room around a conference table and the leader of the meeting, like the president of the university sits down and says, huh, I don't have an agenda. And I'm like, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, you're not my friends. We are, we're not socializing. We're not hanging out. This is in the middle of the day when all of us have better things to do than staring at each other across a conference room, trying to please the president by just sitting here and saying, I'm here, I'm a good employee. Like, so that's another thing is getting precious about your own time and pushing back. Um, the other thing that I would do for time management is I spent a fair amount of time planning my day. You know, in the morning I think, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I'm trying to organize and optimize my time. Like for instance, right now, I'll, I'll tell you it's Thanksgiving morning and, um, you know, I, I have to head out to my, to my family's house, uh, you know, my aunt's house in a little bit. And this morning I made spam musubi for the, for Thanksgiving. And I, post a little video on Instagram about it, if maybe you saw it. 
And then I was done and I, got, I felt like I got done early with making the Spam Asubi. And I was like, okay, I've got a couple hours um, before I got to head out. And I think what most people would do is they'd be like, well, I can't do something productive. It's Thanksgiving morning. Uh, you know, I, I, I've got to do something, you know, else, uh, or I've got to, I have to head out in a couple hours. I, I can't get started on a project, you know, that involves thinking like a podcast. Um, whereas for me, I'm like, Ooh, I, I have two hours. Um, I can, I can, you know, record an episode, something I've been wanting to do for a few weeks actually is to answer these emails. And, and so I, I quickly, um, I think, uh, divert myself from like, this is a family day to, Ooh, I have two hours. I'll do something productive for work for the podcast. And the podcast really feels like work to me, by the way. Um, but this is an example of like me obsessively optimizing my time where I'm like, okay, I have these amount of things that I want to get done this week. I have these amount of things I want to get done this month. How can I cram everything in um, so that things move very quickly. Maybe it's the Japanese in me or something <laughs> like being regimented about time and, and organization. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that I, because my parents raised me well enough, I'm in pretty good connection with my needs and the purpose of my life. And um, I've been in the flow, you know, people like the podcast, like right now, I'm not working at this right now. I'm I'm in my flow. I, I I don't have to I don't have to concentrate on being a podcaster. I don't have to force myself. I'm not nothing's really distracting me. And I and I'm just rambling, right? And I'm I'm in the zone. Um at least I don't know if it it's pleasing or helpful to people when I'm in the zone, but I feel like I'm in the flow right now. I don't have to work at this what I'm doing. And when I'm in the zone, I can get so much more done and I want to do it, right? And how do I how do I get in the zone? Well, I get in the zone because I'm doing something that I know is congruent with my goals in life. I I know that my ultimate goal is to try to make the world a better place and a primary vector for that satisfaction of my life purpose is through the podcast and the, and um so I've 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 also practiced being a podcast for 13 plus years and so I can very quickly shift to those to that mode of being a podcaster in the middle of, of Thanksgiving day, you know, in the morning. And so uh, what am I saying? What I'm saying is that a lot of people I find will say, there's so many things I want to get done, but I, I just never get them done. And I'll, and I'll ask them, well, what's your purpose in life? And they'll be like, I don't know what you're, what you're talking about. I'm like, well, when you think about the things you're doing in a day, why do you, why do you do them? You know, what, why do you even have that plan? And I feel like a lot of people, you know, due to lack of attunement growing up or just a lack of orientation in our society in this way, because we're mainly capitalistic, materialistic, that people don't think about why am I even on this planet? What am I doing here? And that can take years to develop, by the way. But once you really establish that, like I am on this planet to raise happy, healthy children. I'm on this planet to have a happy life. I'm on this planet to spend time in nature. I'm on this planet to uh, change the politics of, of climate change or something. Once you really discover what that is, which can, for some people, take years. So if you're, if you're not in connection with that, like, um, don't, be, don't be demoralized if you can't immediately come up with that. You, there's a path. You have to get in connection with your emotions, your needs, and explore and have other people that will help you explore that. But... When you're really in connection with that, as much as I am in connection with that, and you found activities that meet your existential need and you're in the zone, then you get stuff done so much more quicker because there's there's so much there's there's no procrastination, there's no like, well, I you know, there's no resistance, I guess, is the thing. And you can get you can get a lot done, you know, so in with my life, you know, I, I care about my podcast. I care about being a, a professor. I care about my clients. I care about my family. I care about my house. So, you know, when I'm doing chores around the house, that's another thing that I try to optimize the time for. I, I try to figure out like, okay, how I, I need to do these things. I need to do my laundry. I need to do this. Well, how, how is the, what's the fastest way to do it? The other thing that I'll say is that I listen to a lot of podcasts, right? 
So it's another kind of, you could consider that another activity that I do. And I, I listen to podcasts when I'm doing the laundry or when I'm just walking to the mailbox, you know, I'm, I'm double, I'm always double tasking, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not in the annoying way, like, uh, where I'm neglecting all the tasks, you know, it's like, um, doesn't take much concentration to do the laundry, but I'm listening to a fascinating podcast. And it, sometimes I'm learning things, you know, that enhance my ability to be a podcaster. It's like, oh, I'm absorbing information that I can kind of integrate into my knowledge base so that I can become a better podcaster. So, you know, there's just a lot of things that, but it takes premeditation. You know, there, there's a lot of, uh, I'm obsessed with it. You know, when, when I get the groceries from the grocery store, I spend like 15 seconds staring at the bags in my car, figuring out how, how can I do this in the least amount of trips to the kitchen, which probably doesn't matter that much in the long run. L let me give you a small example of this, just, just to tell you how oriented I am towards time management and saving time so I can use my time in the way that I want to use it. When I was 16 years old, I, you know, correctly predicted that I would be signing my name thousands upon thousands of times throughout my entire life. And I was signing my name in, in this long form cursive, Kirk Honda. And I, and I'm not a very, I don't have very good penmanship. So it's kind of a struggle to do that. And I thought, cause I, and it, cause I observed my mom signing check after check after check, and she has beautiful writing and and I just thought I could probably save like maybe a week of my a week of time if by the end of my life if I had a faster signature. And so I um, double I multitasked by sitting in class at at high in high school, and you know must have been an easy class that I didn't really need to pay pay attention to much or I was bored out of my mind. So I I spent. Um, I don't know, a week or so experimenting with different ways of signing my name. And I landed on one that is extremely uh, hard to replicate, but also only, is only like three strokes. It's one, two, three. It's just three lines essentially. But the way that they're organized, it's hard to replicate. And it's my initials. It's K, it, I, you'd have to see it, but it 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 looks like just this kind of like, um, chaotic mess, but it, if you look closely, it's a K, a J, and an H, um, and they're all overlapping. It's kind of like a, a logo, if you will. But anyway, I, in, at the age of 16, I was like, how can I save time on signing? Because, you know, once you establish your signature, you're kind of set. You know, if you put your signature on your license, you know, sometimes that's what they look at when you're comparing your signature. Is it how, you know, your signature, you can't just midlife like change your signature. It's kind of hard to do. And so, and I uh, at 16 said, I got to, I'm going to start with the right signature. So I've, I do this with a lot of things. You know, there's a lot of things where I'm like, okay, what's the, how can I set up my life so that I don't waste my time? Um, there's just, there's so many little things where, where an investment of time now will save me 10 times the amount of time in the future. I, I'm a very weird person in that way. I, I don't know anyone else who is like that as much as I am. <laughs> and, and a, another thing is that I have a lot of goals in life, you know, like one of the things that, um, and again, I think it's an orientation toward the goals that I have that other people might not be as obsessed with. Like, I think everyone has goals, but I'm like kind of obsessed with my goals. Like one of the goals that I've had for a long time with the podcast is there's so many deep dives I want to do. And now that I'm 50, I'm like, well, I'm kind of on the downward slide of my life and in terms of longevity. And uh, I calculated one time that all the, you know, deep dives that I wanted to do and given how long it takes to research and, and produce, that I was probably only going only gonna to be able to accomplish half of the deep dives I wanted to do, which was really sad to me. I'm like, there's all these, and I'm sure there are, you know, more deep dives that I haven't even thought of that I that I'd want to do. And I'll die before I get to all the deep dives I want to do. And that bums me out. <laughs> okay, like once a month, I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. Like I'm going to die before 
I do all the podcast episodes I want to do. Like, I feel like that's a particular obsessive time orientation um, that most people don't have. So, it, you know, the fact that I quote unquote accomplish a lot, I think has to do with that orientation towards time management <laughs> that I'm really just kind of scratching. The, and as I say it all out loud, it just sounds ridiculous. I, I, I th I'm imagining to some of you, you're just like, my God, you're obsessed. That just sounds very tiring. And I'll say it's not, it's not particularly tiring. You're like, I'm, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sitting. I just spend, I just, it's a little bit of attention. Uh, you know, I feel more attention than I feel like, because my observation over their people is that, you know, they wake up and they're just kind of like surviving minute to minute. And then, uh, and they're reactive to like what's happening around them. And they might even, uh, they also don't necessarily value their own time as, as much as I narcissistically do. And then at the end of the day, they're like kind of tired. And then they just veg in front of the TV for five hours and they go to bed and it just starts all over again. Right. And at no point do they think, is this how I want to be spending my life? You know, whereas I do that literally every day, <laughs> like literally every day I'm like, is this how I want to be spending my life? Am I creating a pattern of who I want to be? And, and, and is this pattern ultimately going to help me, you know, meet my overarching goals in life? Yeah. I don't think about it every day in that way, but so what I'll say is that the pro to me being oriented this way is, yeah, I tend, I tend to get a lot done. The con is that I'm probably not stopping and smelling the roses enough. I'm not, I'm probably too project oriented, too achievement oriented. Um, you know, I don't know. So for those of you who don't watch my YouTube channel, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there's at least some of you, if not a lot of you, I produce, I, I have 17, I, I put out, sorry, I put out 14 videos a week. I publish two reaction videos a day. <laughs> When I, whenever I tell people that, there's like, what? Because I don't know if there's a, I don't know of any other YouTube channel that does that. I'm sure there are some, but I don't know any other YouTube channel that posts two videos every day. Um, primarily because that's what the YouTube audience wants. <laughs> Like the, for some of you who don't watch my YouTube channel, you're just like, what? Two a day? That's, you know, they're shorter. They're like 20 minutes. But um, so I, I probably am working too much. I'm probably not, you know, me recording this episode on Thanksgiving Day. Like maybe I could have I could have taken the day off and just sort of smell the roses. But, you know, to be honest, I'm not a smell the roses. But roses are great and I'll smell them. But but I like to do these things, <laughs> you know, that's why I like, I, I finally just accepted the fact that when I go on vacation, you know, cause most people, it's their ideal vacation is Hawaii. They're on the beach and they're just chilling. I, I'm not, I have, I don't have any desire to do that. That's fine. I get, I see why other people like it, but, and certainly there are times when I'll do that. I'll just, I'll just kind of relax in the sun or something. But pretty quickly, I'm like, let's do something. <laughs> like, I mean, at the very least, like reading a book, right? Like, okay, at least I, I, I entertained myself in that way or I worked on this. Pro I don't know. I, 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 I have carefully engineered my life to the point where what I do for a living feels like a vacation. It feels like um, fun and um, fulfills me. And, you know, I've, I've, that's another thing, actually, that's another little tip is, and I find this, I think this is another narcissistic thing is from a very early point in my life, I thought to myself, there are many jobs out there and it is, you make your own destiny when it comes to a career, uh, barring any kind of oppression in your, in your society about your identities. But um, and since I don't have a lot of oppression, I had a lot of freedom. And so I thought if I don't like my career or if my career isn't fulfilling or if my career is boring or if I get burnt out of my career, I really only have myself to blame because I can do so many things and careers require planning and thinking. 
and self fulfillment. And so, um, and I think one of the reasons why I, and so, you know, when I'm in that zone, I don't put things off. I don't procrastinate. I enjoy it. I, you know, I, it, it's, it's, um, I'd rather do the podcast than watch TV, you know, that I'd rather work because, you know, the podcast is my main job now. I'd rather go to work than watch um, TV a lot most of the time because it's funner for me to do the podcast than it is for me to watch TV. You know, whereas for some people, they can't wait to leave work so they can go home and watch TV because, you know, and so I think that's another reason why I get a lot done is because my, the things that I do are, um, you know, extremely fun to me because I have thought so long and hard about um, what a career I, that fits well with me. And, and I attribute this to when I was young uh, in my teens and I had, you know, I had a number of jobs and some of them were great and some of them were not. And like the, the jobs that I didn't like were, um, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I hated them, but they were not as good as other jobs were, you know, being a busboy at Denny's, you know, it's a diner in, in the United States. And um, I was a busboy or a dishwasher. You know, these jobs, they weren't terrible, but they paid very little. You're on your feet all day, very stressful. Um, you get, you're real tired at the end of the day. And then a little bit later, I get a job as a security guard and all I did was sit in this booth and open a gate when cars wanted to get in to this community. It was a gated community, and I was the, the security guard. And I got this job because my dad knew, had a friend who was like a manager there, and he got me the job. And so I had these, I had, and I had a few other jobs that were kind of like this. And, um, and I would contrast these two jobs. Like on one job, it completely wipes me out, and I'm paid less than this job where I'm a security guard and I just sit there all day. In fact, I would I would invite friends over <laughs> to my booth or I'd bring in my guitar and I'd write music or I'd make I'd do my homework. You know, I'd again this multitasking. I'd be like, I'm at work, I'm getting paid, but I'm also, you know, getting a bunch of stuff done. And I think at that age, you know, sixteen or something, I was like, huh. So if I if I finagle my career right I can choose between jobs like the security guard job where it doesn't even really feel like work or manual labor as a busboy in a, in a Denny's or landscaper manual labor or, you know, hard jobs that wipe you out and ache your bones, <laughs> you know, and that's just me. You know, some people really love working in restaurants, so I'm not saying that, you know, but I was, I was discovering who I was and what fit well with me. And I've been obsessed with that from the beginning of my life. You know, I've, I've been obsessed with like, okay, how do I, how do I engine, how do I invest time and energy today? Like going to grad school or something so that I can, so that I can get to this optimal lifestyle later on in life and time management and getting projects done has, has a big part to, you know, in that, in that like a prediction of the future. Um, like this podcast, for example, when I first started doing the podcast 13 years ago, I, I, you know, fell in love with it very quickly. And I was just like, oh, how do I make this into something that makes money? So I, so I can cut back on my hours at the university and, and in my practice. And I've talked about this before. Like I constantly every day, almost thought, how do I monetize this thing? <laughs> Cause most podcasts are not monetizable or they're minimally monetized. You know, how do I, how do I make money at this thing? How, you know, is it advertising? Is it donations? Is it, you know, and every day, you know, and I've talked about this before that for seven, eight years, I was unsuccessful, but I kept at it and I kept experimenting and every day, eight years, how many days is that? That's thousands of, of days, right? Just day in and day out, just failing at monetizing this podcast, you know, how do I, finagle? Cause, because to me, I'm like, this is what I want to do, you know? And if I can make that happen, then think of the other things I could get done. Think of the deep dives I could do if, if I actually had the full week to just really dive into the podcast, you know, cause that, that's what I want to do. And so, uh, 
you know, the, it's the, I think it's that obsessiveness. So when people are like, you know, how do I get as much done as you? I, I don't know, unless you can change your wiring to become as, as obsessed as I am, I, I, I don't know if it's possible, you know, because some people, because uh, I've been, you know, people have been close to me where they've told me about this. They're just like, how do you get so much crap done in a day? Like, I, it's already seven o'clock and I feel like I didn't get anything done. You, you've done three things already. And so when I talk to, you know, people, I'm, I'm you know, and, and I would, at, in my past, I would say, well, you know, do this, do that, do that. And over time, I just learned that for most people, they just like to veg and that's okay. And, and I would tell people that I'd just be like, look, um, maybe uh, you're just, maybe you're deprioritized or you're, you're, um, shaming yourself for liking to veg. Maybe vegging is a project that you get done in the day. Maybe that's a big part of your life and that's okay. It, you know, there's nothing lesser about watching Netflix, you know, in the evening. It, it, it's, it, there's nothing shameful about that. And, you know, we live in a, you know, achievement oriented culture and maybe, maybe you just have to accept that that is the purpose of your life is to veg half of your life and just chill. <laughs> so that's okay. You know, may, may, you know, because I see a lot of people beating themselves up and, and trying to, um, you know, accomplish things that they've always wanted to accomplish. Now, on the flip side, if I think you spend some upfront premeditated time, um, you can actually, uh, I think, change your system such that more things will get done. Anyway, the other thing I want to say is um, I imagine that I'm there's a possibility that my life is actually not great <laughs> given my obsession with projects and time management. It's possible that I'm deluding myself into thinking that this is the life I'm supposed to live when in fact, maybe on my deathbed, I'll be like, dude, you just should have relaxed more. <laughs> like maybe even like spent more time with people really, you know, like more quality time with people. Um, so I'm not saying that w what I'm doing is what's good in life, even though that might be kind of coming across. I do try to think about that, but you know, it's possible I'm deluding myself. It's possible I'm chasing some dragon that, you know, isn't conducive to happiness or the meaning of my life or something. So I'm just answering the question, like, how do I get so much done? <laughs> anyway. uh, I feel like I talk about this too much, honestly. Um, but I think I like talking about it. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, um, this is going to be published, I think, a week after Thanksgiving. But um, so I hope you all had a good Thanksgiving. Um, I will give thanks to you for being with me in this journey. I consider this to be a, a two-way relationship, people emailing in and, and me, you know, answering those emails. I, you know, I know a number of you and, um, I, you know, I do not do this. I would not do this if it weren't for you, honestly. You know, I, I, I feel like, um, over the years I've, I've had a, uh, you know, me talking about how, you know, why I always wanted to monetize this, why I don't consider this podcast to be work. It's because of you. Because um, if it was just me yammering into a microphone for no purpose, you know, I wouldn't do it. But the fact that people make it a two-way conversation, the fact that people appreciate it and um, find value in it is, um, you know, it just fills me with so much purpose and, and life. You know, the reason why I lament not being able to do all the pod, all the deep dives is because y'all have, you know, encouraged me. And so um, we're building this together. And I thank you for that. And take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do. Mm -hmm.